Thank you, Brother Tom. It is good to be back in God's house this morning. We had a great time last Sunday out at the park, and God gave us a wonderful morning, wonderful weather uh, that we enjoyed last, last Sunday. Didn't know with all the hot weather we'd been having whether we'd be able to endure it or not, but God gave us a beautiful day and a wonderful time of celebration together. And then also the parade was a wonderful time. Uh, we, uh, we got behind another float. Another church had a float in front of us, and they kept stopping and uh, allowing everybody else to get way ahead of them. It slowed us down, so I think the pace of the parade was a little bit more uh, easy for those that were walking in it. And, um, but there were some people that were out in the heat and not enjoying it at all. We got towards the end, of, very end of the parade, and there were some police officers directing the flow of the traffic, the flow of the parade. And my grandson was on the float, and he had a super soaker. And people were standing on the sideline, hit me, hit me, you know, and he's squirting them. He squirted a police officer. Boston squirted a police officer at the end of the parade, and he was, this police officer had lost his patience. The parade was taking too long for him. He says, I gotta be eight hours in this heat. He says, I don't want to be squirted, and I thought, they're going to arrest my grandson. I'm going <laughs> to here on this parade, but we had a great time. I had a lot of fun with it and saw a lot of folks that sometimes we don't get to see except at the parade time. They're on the side of the road, uh, on the side of the streets, cheering for the, uh, the parade, and we enjoyed that time very, very much. Well, I invite you to turn your Bibles this morning to the first epistle of Peter, first letter of Peter, first Peter. We're going to be in this for now for several months. We're going to go through this uh, chapter by chapter. We're going to do an exposition of this book. This is Peter's survival guide for Christians, and we're going to see how to overcome fiery trials in our life. And I believe it's going to be a, a rich study. I hope that you'll plan on being with us throughout this study because it has a lot to say to us. I'm going to read the first five verses we're going to look at this morning. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again to a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Father, we come to you this morning, and as we approach this subject matter of trials in life, Father, all of us have them. That's something in common with everybody in this room. Some of the trials perhaps are in a different area than others. Some have financial trials that they're facing, some physical, some it's a matter of relationships. But Lord, all of us at some time in our life run into trials that seem to want to overcome us. But we can be overcomers. We can be more than conquerors through him who loved us. And I pray, Father, as we study this lesson this morning and as we begin into this great book, that you've given to us, Father, for times of fiery trials in our life that we might learn from it and we might know how to not only gain uh, encouragement for our own soul, but to share it with others who may be uh, going under a trial. And we pray, Father, for your, your, your strength and your understanding as we open your word. We pray in your name and for your sake. Amen. On one of my vacations... I'm not really sure as I was thinking back where I was at the time. It was probably a trip that we had taken to the Smoky Mountains. It could have been up to northern Michigan. I'm not sure. But I saw a very interesting uh, pamphlet at a visitor center, and I picked it up and began to read it. It was How to Survive an Encounter with a Bear. How to Survive an Encounter with a Bear. And as I began to read, I was really interested. The very first point was... Identify yourself by talking calmly to the bear so that he knows you are a human and not a prey animal. Just introduce yourself, all right, to that bear. Hello, Mr. Bear. I want you to know I am not uh, the main entree for today. I'm just a stupid tourist walking in your area, all right? And uh, do it calmly. 
do it calmly, which always kind of reminds me of the, the advice the flight uh, attendants give you when you get on a plane. You know, anybody who's ever flown gets on a plane, they'll give you this whole list of what to do. In the case of an emergency, uh, an oxygen mask will drop from the ceiling. You're to put that over your nose and mouth and breathe normally. Right. The plane is malfunctioning. We're going to crash. Just breathe normally. <laughs> if I can breathe at all, I'm going to be, you know, sucking air at that time. Well, you know, that pamphlet on uh, encountering a bear may be uh, vital if a person's hiking in the Smoky Mountains or any other national park inhabited by large numbers of bears. But I do most of my walking in my neighborhood or over in Wapple Horse Park, where it's very unlikely I'm going to run into a black bear. More likely I'll run into a big black dog than a black bear. But uh, so, you know, sometimes, you know, we look at these things and we see these types of suggestions. I did an internet search. I got really curious on survival guides. And I found that there are literally hundreds, if not thousands of guides to help you survive all types of dangerous scenarios from being lost in the woods to surviving an attack from a charging rhinoceros. And there are even several uh, guides available on surviving a zombie apocalypse. All right, I, I, I thought I've got a picture there of several of the covers that I went, not, not all of them, but that's just a sampling of all the different guides there are. I thought it was really interesting that next to the zombie apocalypse was surviving uh, being a teen girl. Teen girls survive, I guess that's just about as tough as being attacked by zombies as being a teenage girl. Of course, I was a youth pastor for several years and I can, find, I can tell you that a lot of teenage girls go through a very dramatic period during that time, so it must be very trying for them. But uh, while those encounters may be rare, such as a charging rhinoceros, unless you jump the fence over at the St. Louis Zoo uh, or something of that nature, and, uh, or maybe non-existent like a zombie apocalypse, many survivalists agree that it's important that you remember the priority of the rule of three, the rule of three. And that rule state this, you can survive for three minutes without air, oxygen, or in icy water. You can survive three hours without shelter in a harsh environment, extreme cold. Uh, you can survive three days without water. You can survive three weeks without food if you have water and shelter. The main point that they're making through this rule of threes is that we have to focus on the most immediate problem first. If the weather is warm, you probably need to focus on finding water as your priority. Securing food and, shelter and building a shelter can wait. There's no need to think about food or water, however, if you're cold and wet, as hypothermia presents the greatest threat to your survival. Make no mistake, if you're shivering and can't get dry or warm, you may not be able to function after three hours. If you're alone, you may, not, you may have only three hours to live, so you better know how to build a fire and get warm in a case like that. I would like to add one more three to the list. I believe it's doubtful that a person can survive three seconds without hope. The most important thing for a person to survive in trying circumstances is to have hope in their life. Without hope, you have no will to go on you're likely to just give up. These are troubling times in our world that we are living in, and our world desperately needs hope, and they're looking for hope. The only problem is that the world's hope, mankind's hope, is a dead hope. They, they've looked everywhere for it. People turn to the halls of education believing that man can invent a brave new world. They turn to Wall Street hoping that money will bring happiness. In desperation, they even look to Washington and local and state government to legislate a better life. Now, that's really grasping at hope, all right, at that point. It's a frustrating search for hope without the true source of hope, which is Jesus Christ. Paul said to the Ephesians that before we were saved, he said over in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, we were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, 
having no hope. Without Jesus Christ, we don't have any real hope. Christ gives us hope. Mankind's hope is a dead hope, but now as believers in Christ, we have what the world is looking for, that is hope. In fact, we have a living hope, as Peter tells us here in verse number three, a hope that gives us the confidence, the encouragement, and enablement we need to really live. Hope in Christ is not a sedative. It is a shot of adrenaline. It makes life worth living. Peter wrote this letter as a survival guide for believers going through trials. In fact, the apostle knew that a severe fiery trial was coming. We'll get to that when we get to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Things were hot for them as believers in the early church. They were under a lot of persecution and being isolated just because they acted differently than the rest of the pagan world around them, and people didn't like it. They didn't trust the Christians. They didn't like the way they live. And so they, they ostracized them and pushed them to the sides. But there was a fiery trial coming when it would become a government-inflicted, government-sanctioned persecution. Nero had a plan. Of course, God allowed Peter to know that this fiery trial was coming. But in a few short years, and I think it was in the year 64, Nero wanted to rebuild. He wanted to tear down Rome and rebuild it according to his own designs. He was going to rename it Neropolis after himself. But in order to clear the space, he had some of his uh, henchmen set fire to the city of Rome. And they burned many, many acres of Rome at that time. Well, Nero found out that that wasn't a really popular idea with the people. They didn't much like being burned out of house and home. And so as he was facing increased uh, anger from the people, he found a scapegoat. It was the early church. Some of his advisors said, here's what you do. Just blame the Christians for it. You know, they're always talking about the fire of the spirit and God coming in fiery judgment and the world's going to end in fire. Let's just blame them. Everybody will believe that. They don't like the Christians anyways. And so it became a government-sanctioned persecution that became very, very intense and many Christians lost their lives during that persecution, some of them being crucified. And Peter himself would die that way. He would be crucified upside down uh, because he didn't feel worthy to be uh, crucified like his Lord. And so many Christians would face a very violent deaths in the coming years. And as I was studying for this message, one pastor, one, one preacher said, it would do good for us to really study the book of 1 Peter because those days may be coming upon us, folks. You know, we're under certain persecutions today. People don't like the Christian message. They don't like our Christ, so they're not going to like us. But the day may come when we're going to start facing government-sanctioned persecution. We're seeing some of that, uh, you know, leading up to it in our society today. Now, this is not a negative message. I'm not up here wringing my hands, woe is me. This is a very positive message because we have hope. We have hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 1 tells us that Peter was writing to a group of people who had reason to be discouraged and needed some hope. They were strangers scattered throughout the region, five different regions he gives here, and they were displaced by the persecution that accompanied their faith in Christ. The term stranger there in verse 1 refers to a resident foreigner or a pilgrim. They were forced out of their homes to wander in a world that was really not their own. And we're, we're just, this world is not our home. We can identify with that. We're just traveling through. We're strangers and pilgrims in this world. We're not a part of this world system. One day our journey is going to end and we will be home. But until then, we have reason of hope, no matter how difficult the road may become. So our first point of survival as we go through the book of 1 Peter, is identify yourself, not to the bear, all right, but identify yourself as a child of God. Because the first point of surviving in this world is to know that you are a child of God, and that's where Peter starts here in his letter, knowing you have a personal relationship with Christ. We are saved by grace. We are saved by grace. 
He says there in verse 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Here he gives us the plan of salvation, God's plan of salvation. The first thing we see about God's plan is we are elect, and elect means favored or special or chosen. A believer is a favored individual in the sight of God, not because of anything we've done, but according to his abundant mercy. He has had abundant mercy towards us, and so we are his chosen people. He loves us, amen? And we're going to see more about that as we go along. Our salvation, first of all, was purposed or planned by the Father. We are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Now, the terms election and predestination have been a heated battleground among Baptist brethren for centuries. And I'm not here to try to settle all the theological knots or untie all the knots. But, you know, it boils down to this question. Did I choose God or did God choose me? Did I choose God or did God choose me? And the answer to that question is a resounding yes. Yes, it depends on your perspective, how you're looking at it. The divine purpose, the sovereignty of God and human choice, free will, seem to be at odds, but they're both equally true in the plan of God. Someone asked Spurgeon one day, who was a Calvinist, a a very strong Calvinist, how do you reconcile human will and the sovereignty of God? And he says, I never try to reconcile friends. He said, these things, are they go together. We don't always understand in our human mind how this goes. God is over all. God is in control of everything. Amen? We believe that. God is sovereign. But he's also given us a free will. He's given us... Uh, opportunity to choose. Nothing God plans absolves man or frees man from his responsibility to choose, and nothing man chooses can alter God's plan. You say, well, how does that work? I don't know. I'm not God. And uh, But my pastor, Jimmy Allen, the church I grew up in, always had a beautiful way of explaining this seeming conflict. He said, when we come to God, there's a door of salvation. On one side of the door, it says, whosoever will, let him come. And when we enter into the door of salvation and we are on the other side, we look back at the door, and on the other side of the door, it says, chosen before the foundation of the world. So who are the elect? The elect are whosoever will. Whosoever will, let him come. If you want to be saved, come. Don't worry about whether or not you're elect or not. Just come. Because the very last chapter of the Bible, in Revelation chapter 22, verse 17, it says, The Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him who is athirst come and take of the water of life freely. And whosoever will, let him come. Whosoever will, let him come. So we need to understand that God opens the uh, door of invitation to us. In fact, I've always had a a hard time understanding people who say that God only has certain ones that he allows to be saved. Because Jesus said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I had a friend of mine one time said, well, you know, God made the invitation. God can invite who he wants to invite. That's true. If I had a party, I could invite anybody I want to invite. But if I got up here and said, everyone is welcome, whosoever wants to can come, to the party, and you started to come and say, whoa, 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 wait a minute, you can't come, I didn't choose you. That wouldn't have been a true invitation, would it? But God gave an authentic invitation to whosoever will, let him come. I believe that anybody who wants to come, God is willing to allow them to come at that time. God knew before you were ever a twinkle in your daddy's eye that you were going to receive Christ as your personal Savior. His foreknowledge knew that before. And so we are chosen by God. Not only are we chosen in our salvation beforehand, he predestinated events in our life to mold us for his service. What is the predestination of God? That is the uh, arrangement of things in our life to shape us for service for God. God shaped your life purposely for you to become the kind of believer you will be. Are you following me? Some of this may be a little hard, but I'm... I'm going to make you think just a little bit, okay? Um, 
You know, whether your childhood was a hallmark moment or maybe it was hell marked, but either way, God was shaping you to become an ambassador of his grace. You know, some people have come from wonderful Christian homes, have walked with God and learned God, learned the scriptures from the time they were very small children, and God can use them in his service. But he's taken some of the people that have come from the roughest backgrounds, and that very rough background enables them to reach people who are in a similar place in their life. And God molds your life so that you can be used in his service. He's predestined, he's already prearranged for your life to take the course that it will so that you can be of ultimate service for him. So God has planned, the Father has planned our salvation, and then our salvation was promoted or pursued by the Spirit. It is through sanctification of the Spirit. Now that word sanctification is a big churchy word. You don't hear that outside of the church building. But the word sanctification just simply means to be set apart for special use. You know, we have certain, I I used to say this, and Paul is correcting me, he says we don't have that anymore. Most of our dishes have gotten broke, and we only have one set of dishes. We used to have sanctified dishes. Sanctified that was used when we had special company. You know, we'd bring those out, and we'd use those kind of uh, dishes for when we had special company. Now we're kind of just down to what you get. When you come to my house, you just eat what's, you know, you know hopefully it's good food on the plate, and you just enjoy whatever plate it's on, all right? But in God's uh, plan... He has set us apart, and that's the work of the Holy Spirit. He's marked us out through bringing conviction on our hearts. The Holy Spirit convicts us and brings conviction to our heart and sets us apart for God's salvation in our life. That's what Jesus promised his disciples the Spirit would do after he was gone. When Jesus said, I'm going away, but if I go away, I will send another comforter. Another of the same kind will come, and he'll be with you. Not only will he be with you, he'll be in you. And he said this to the disciples, when he, that is the Holy Spirit, is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. People know they're not doing the right thing. They know they're living according to their own will in their own way. They're not believing, they're not trusting on Jesus Christ to live their life. They're trusting their own wits and their own schemes, and they know they're not living the way God wants them to live. So the Holy Spirit convicts people of that. And then he says, of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. The Holy Spirit also convicts us of righteousness. We're not living the right way. He says, because I go to the Father. What does that mean? Jesus, while Jesus was here, his very life was a conviction to those people that were around. They said, nobody can live this way. Nobody can live, uh, you know, a godly life. But Jesus' life was so godly, it put him under conviction. When they saw him, they hated him. Why? Because his life showed that they were not living right. So now he's gone away. So now the Holy Spirit does that work. Jesus is not here bodily to bring that conviction so the Holy Spirit now indwells believers. He will indwell Sue. And Sue, when she begins to follow the Holy Spirit's leadership in her life, begins to live her life in such a way that other people around her say, you know, I should be living more like that, but I can't live like that. And it brings them under conviction. And so as we are surrendered to the Holy Spirit, that conviction comes on people. The Holy Spirit came to convict of sin of righteousness, we're not living the right way, we're living the wrong way, we're not living the right way, and of judgment to come. You know, people know that payday comes someday. Everybody believes there should be some justice in this world. Always amuses me that when I watch the news and people are out marching for justice. We want justice. No, they don't want justice. They want revenge against the other guy. They want the other guy punished. They don't want it for themselves. I don't want justice for me. I want mercy. I don't want to get what I deserve. I want to get God's grace in my life. Amen? But uh, we know that there is a judgment, and the Holy Spirit convicts men that there will come a payday someday. No matter how you put it out of your mind, no matter how you try to push it off, someday we know that we're going to give an account for our life before a righteous God. 
Furthermore, the Spirit continue, continues to set us apart in this world as he guides us daily, as I've said. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall, he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. In other words, when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to keep pointing you to Jesus Christ. I worry about any group that puts emphasis on the Holy Spirit to the exclusion of Jesus. When the Holy Spirit becomes the focus, that's not what the Holy Spirit came to do. The Holy Spirit didn't come to say, hey, look at me, look what I can do, look at, look at me speak in unknown tongues or do other things. That's not what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit directs people to Jesus Christ and brings conviction to other people's hearts that they're not following Christ. And so our salvation was planned by the Father, it was pursued by the Spirit, and it was purchased by the Son. Verse, uh, continue on there in the verse, and it says, We are sprinkled by the blood of Christ. We are unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now that term sprinkling, it refers back to an Old Testament symbolism. There were three occasions when blood was sprinkled in the Old Testament. One time it was, it was uh, symbolic of cleansing. If a person had had leprosy and got clean, that was a miraculous event in their life. They were sprinkled, they were to go to the priest who was to sprinkle blood on them to signify that they were clean. You know, they had been cleansed. And so there was a sprinkling of blood that signified cleansing. There was also a sprinkling of blood for consecration to service. When the priest was separated to the office of being a priest, he was sprinkled by blood, uh, the blood that was offered there in the temple, and so he was set apart for the service of God. And then there's the blood that was sprinkled for, as a seal for the covenant, the promise of God that this was going to be carried out. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. The blood of Jesus Christ enables us to serve him. We serve through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is also the seal of God's covenant. It is the promise that he has made that he will never let us go. We'll get more into that in just a moment. So <laughs> this is an amazing plan, isn't it? The Father thought it, the Spirit wrought it, and the Son bought it. You know, it's a very simple plan of salvation, but it is so marvelous as you begin to study it, so incomprehensible. I don't understand all about the plan of salvation. It's a simple plan. I can tell you what God's plan of salvation is and how you can be saved, but ask me to explain all of it. I can't, I can't explain it. But you know what? I can't explain electricity either. I'm not really sure how electricity works, but I'm not going to sit in the dark until I do. So, you know, the important thing is, is that you apply salvation to your heart and life. Whosoever will, let him come. The scripture does not say, whosoever understands, let him come. But whosoever will, let him come. You don't have to worry about how all of this works out. I heard that one of the young people was really at camp this year, was kind of struggling with trying to understand how it is that God saves us. And you, you may never understand how it all works, but you can trust that what God has said is true. Whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of life freely. So that's God's plan, and then he gives us the product. What happens as a result of all of this? It says, grace unto you, unto you, those who are elect, those who have been saved, have come to Christ, the Spirit is convicted, and they've surrendered to God and, and uh, applied the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Grace unto you and peace. Grace and peace was a dual greeting in the early church. You find it in all of Paul's writing. He will always say grace and peace. It's always in that order. You have to know grace before you can know peace. But it also spoke to a diversified body of believers. The early church was made up of a diversity of people. There were the Greeks, and grace, charis, spoke to them. They were outside of all of the promises, the history of God with his people, and it was God's grace that he extended forgiveness to the Gentiles. That's you and I. We're Gentiles, most of us. I don't know if we have any 
full-blooded Jews here or not, but as Gentiles, we're, we are saved by the grace of God. He's included us in his promises. And peace is shalom, which was the traditional Jewish greeting, still is to this day. So peace and shalom, or grace and shalom be to you. God's grace and peace be multiplied, not just a little bit, it's multiplied to us through salvation. The church body is a body found and filled by an all-sufficient God, and he doesn't give us just a little bit. He multiplies his blessings to us. God is not stingy. Amen? The if God loved me, I would have more of this or more of that or more of the other thing. That was his lie to Eve in the garden. If God really loved you, you'd have you know, access to all the fruit of the trees of the garden. But God knows in the day you eat of that fruit, you'll be as God's knowing good and evil. God's holding something out on you. And so the devil tries to convince us that God is stingy. But I read in the word of God how God multiplies all of his goodness to us. We are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, Paul told the Ephesians. All spiritual blessings. God gives all of himself to us. I love the way that Spurgeon explained this, explained the richness of Christ. He said, he hath given us his all. Although a tithe of his possessions would have made a universe of angels rich beyond all thought, he was not content until he had given us all that he possessed. How many of us are living on mere crumbs when he has the table spread with his amazing bounty? God has more than we need for our life. We're just kind of walking along, living on crumbs. But we need to realize we have all these things provided in Jesus Christ. He gives us comfort for the present through grace and peace and confidence for the future. He gives us a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Read verse 3. I'm trying to memorize this myself, but I'm not going to trust my mind up here in the pulpit this morning. But I love this verse. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy, abundant mercy, hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He's given us a lively hope. Now, many translations, maybe one that you have in your lap this morning, will interpret that phrase as a living hope. But I like the expression lively. I like my Bible. It says, I have a lively hope. We're not just saved to live or exist for Christ, but to live more abundantly and to live without, with, rather, live with expectation, anticipation. I, when I see that word lively, I told you last week, I said I hate to always use my grandchildren as an illustration, but they make such good sermon illustrations, I can't resist it. You know, when I see my grandchildren, I see lively young people. I like to be around lively young people. Amen? I like to be around lively old people. You know, some, I heard about a church one time where a member had a heart attack and died in the service. And they called the paramedics, and the paramedics arrived, and they carried out three people before they found the right one. So, you know, most Baptist churches need to know what it is to be lively. All right? Some of you are, you know more like the casting call for Night of the Living Dead than you are you know, an advertisement for the lively hope that's in Jesus Christ. God has given us a lively hope. You know, when the alarm goes off in the morning, I want to tell you something. I wake up. I'm alive, but I'm not very lively. It takes a while for me to get lively in the morning. It takes me a couple of cups of coffee, you know, and my walk in the morning, and then I begin to get more lively in my life. But I am determined that I want to be a good example of what it is to have a lively hope uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's wonderful to be saved by grace. But Peter doesn't stop there. He tells us also that we are scheduled for glory. We are saved by grace, and then we are scheduled for glory. Verse number four, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Why doesn't God give us everything right up front? Why, does he give, why is he reserved part of it? Why is he held part of it back in reservation for us? 
Well, perhaps you've read accounts or you've heard news reports of some heir of a very wealthy person. That person passes away and, they, and the inheritance goes to the children. And in a very short time, they squander it. It's gone. They've wasted it. And uh, yet some people who are wealthy are smart enough, they know their children well enough that they have made provisions so that when they passed away, that some of the inheritance went to the children, but then the rest of it was put in a trust that they couldn't get a hold of until later on when they were more mature and able to understand and appreciate the wealth that they had. You know, many times if God gave us everything we wanted right up front, we wouldn't appreciate it. But he has given us enough so that we have what we need. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. He gives us everything we need. And uh, so he is, he's provided for us, but he doesn't give it to us all at once. He's reserved part of it for us. Now, I'm glad it's reserved. I, uh, you probably have made reservations at some time. I'm sure there's people here that have made reservations, got to where you were going, and they didn't have your reservation. Somebody messed up. Anybody, uh, happened, has that happened to anybody? Okay, got a couple of hands. You know, we've got, Paul and I have reservations for a vacation later on this month. I hope nobody messes that up. Okay, because I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to time with my wife uh, away, and so I'm looking forward to it. So I hope nobody messes up my reservation. But I don't have to worry about that with what God has reserved. Our riches in Christ cannot be destroyed. They cannot be corrupted. They're incorruptible. They can't be destroyed. No thief or enemy can steal the treasure that's laid up for me in heaven. You know, I think about the poor people that followed the, the investment advice of Bernie Madoff. That's going back a few years, but the whole Enron scandal and that people who had all of their retirement funds, uh, they thought guaranteed. They woke up one morning to find out they had nothing because they were uh, cheated. But the inheritance that we have in Christ, nobody can touch. I, uh, I like the story of Mary Deal. I have a biography of Mary and Elmer Deal. In fact, this church supported the Deals uh, when they were still alive. They've both gone on to heaven now. But they were missionaries to Africa. And uh, in the book I have called Out of the Mouth of the Lion, it tells the story of Mary and Elmer Deal, and Mary learned a lesson early on as a missionary. When they would leave the field, their home there, they would try to secure it. They, they'd have a home there in Africa that they had um, supplied and furnished. And when they'd come back from their year of furlough, they inevitably find that all of their belongings had been stolen. Somebody broke in and stole it. So Mary Deal, would leave Africa to come home on furlough every four years with only a suitcase, knowing that when she and Elmer returned, all of the belongings they left behind would be stolen. Her hope was not in what she could accumulate here, but what she had laid up in heaven. She adjusted her heart to say, this is only stuff, and God is keeping the record. The most important things I have are laid up in heaven, and nobody can touch it there. Our riches in Christ cannot be destroyed. They cannot be defiled. How many of the golden moments in life that we've had have been stained by sin? You know, things that we've obtained and yet have not really enjoyed them because of sin or because of some kind of sorrow in our life because of sin. There's a great verse in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22, that says, The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. You really want to be rich and have it without any guilt or any uh, pain at all. Have what the Lord gives to you. The blessing of the Lord maketh you rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. In heaven, nothing will spoil the enjoyment of our inheritance. There, God tells us, he shall wipe away all tears from our eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Our riches in Christ cannot be destroyed, they cannot be defiled, and they cannot be decayed or depreciated. It says there that they, uh, they're undefiled and they fade not away. Time takes the shine and glitter off of so many things that capture our attention in this life. 
you know, uh, we all know about the effect of inflation on the money that we have set aside. Some people started saving for retirement or saving for later on in life, and they thought they had a good nest egg saved up, but then came about time to start uh, using it, and the inflation has eaten away until it's not as big as they thought it was at the time. But our investment in Christ does not fade away. Depreciation can't touch it. And uh, 10,000 years won't begin to diminish the wonder of our heavenly home. Well, God's plan of salvation is complete, and whosoever will may come. And once you're saved, God has a wonderful inheritance, riches for you, reserved in heaven. That ought to be enough to make a Baptist shout. You know, it ought to make you excited. If you can't shout about that, you're probably dead already. But uh, in addition to that, Peter adds one more tremendous truth that gives us a lively hope. We are secured by God. We're saved by grace. We are scheduled for glory. And we are secured by God. Verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. That word kept is a very interesting word because it, it refers to being protected by a military guard within a city that somebody is watching over, keeping and protecting. And uh, the power that keeps us resides within us. It's the Holy Spirit. We are sealed by the Spirit of God and protected. Amen. You know, we have better protection than the President of the United States. He has the Secret Service. We have the Sovereign Service. He only has armed guards. We have Almighty God who's watching over us. We need not worry about losing our salvation. The power of God, not my own feeble efforts, keeps me saved. You see, folks, once you trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you have a a promised uh, end. You are going to be in his presence. We are sealed until the day of redemption, till the day we stand before him. God has sealed us. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Then in Jude, Jude says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory and with exceeding joy. And if that's not good enough for you, this is Jesus' own words in John chapter 10. He says, I give unto them those sheep that hear my voice and they respond to me, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Get that picture. Nobody can pluck them, a saved individual, one of my sheep, out of my hand. Jesus has a hold of you. He says, and nobody can pluck them out of my Father's hand. The Father's hand is over the Son's hand. Well, if I take all of those scriptures, I'm sealed by the Holy Spirit on the inside, then I'm in the hand of Jesus, and then Jesus is in the Father's hand. If the devil was ever going to get to me, he'd have to pry away the fingers of the Father. He'd have to pry away the fingers of the Son. And he'd have to break the seal of the Holy Spirit. And the devil ain't that strong, folks. You are secure in him. We are kept by him. And that is all according to his promise. A soul that puts their trust in Christ are completely saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, right? That's, that's an accomplished fact. That word saved, saved means it's accomplished. He doesn't say will be saved. They are saved. That is a done deal. We are saved. I, I've used the illustration before. I say, can you imagine a guy drowning? And a guy's drowning out there, uh, maybe at Creve Corps Lake or something. He's splashing around. He says, help, help, help. And the lifeguard jumps in the water. He swims out to him, gets him around the shoulder, uh, under the arms and starts paddling and bringing him back. About halfway to shore, he just lets him go, and then he comes the rest of the way. And the guy that he went out there to rescue just sinks. 
Well, the lifeguard gets out on the shore and he goes, oh, well, I saved him. People standing on the shore said, no, you didn't save him, he drowned. Look at that, he, he went down way back there. In other words, he gave up on him before he got him safely to the place of, of salvation. God doesn't do it halfway, he brings us all the way, amen, to the day of redemption. He brings us to his own self. When a soul puts their trust in Christ, they are completely, utterly saved. However, every aspect of salvation is not completely revealed to us. It is reserved or ready to be revealed in the last time. I know that I was saved from the penalty of sin's past. When I got saved, Jesus Christ wiped away sin's guilt out of my life. I know also that I am being delivered from the power of sin right now in the present. But one day, the Bible says that I will be saved from the very presence of sin. I can't wait for that day. Can't wait for the day when sin will no longer have any kind of pull or effect on me. In fact, it won't even be around to pull on me. It'll be totally gone. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. When Christ, who is our life, Paul said to the Colossians in Colossians 3, 4, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. God has some great things still in store for us. Salvation is wonderful, but we haven't experienced all of it yet. One of these days, we're going to experience it fully. We'll be in his presence. We'll see him, and we'll be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And one of these days, in his presence, we're going to appear with him in glory. And then he's going to say, well done, hopefully, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. And I, I, I want to just stop and say something about that expression because for so many years, I thought that God's inviting us to come into the joys of heaven. But that's really not what Jesus is inviting us to. When we've served him, he's saying, well done. You've done well in this race. You've served me well. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. The joy that he has in his accomplished work is something we will enjoy fully because we've been a part of it. We've been a part of what God's been doing in this world. Now, sometimes it, it, it's pretty hard. Sometimes it's, it's strenuous. Sometimes it takes, you know, a lot of self-sacrifice to accomplish certain things. But in that day, when, we, when Jesus says, come here and enjoy it with me, we'll look back over it and say, I was a part of this. I was a part of God's plan. Isn't that a wonderful thought? I'm a part of what God was doing. I can enter into his joy of what he's accomplished. When he is crowned king of kings and lord of lords and every knee bows and every tongue confesses, we'll be able to say, he's my king. I told you. I told you so. And uh, we'll enjoy his coronation because we'll be able to say, I was a part of his plan down here. There are times when the outlook is dim in life. Troubles come. During those times, we need to try the uplook. If the outlook is dark, we need the uplook. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus. God has given us a lively hope that does not depend on our temporary circumstances in this life. That ought to be enough to even make a Baptist shout. You know, God has something great planned for you, and you can be a part of it. If you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, whosoever will may come. God has planned. He's predestined a great future for you. He has a great plan for your life if you will but trust him and accept him as your personal savior. The Holy Spirit may be tugging at your heart right now saying, I want you to be a part of this. And the Holy Spirit is tugging at your heart and saying, you're not a part of the family of God. You need to get saved. You know your life is not right. You know there's sin in your life. You need to get things right with God. And the Holy Spirit is sanctifying. He's pulling you and setting you aside and saying, you need to come out from that and be apart from that. And Jesus Christ shed his precious blood so that you can believe. 
And if Jesus Christ has died for you in your place, all you have to do is accept that payment from Calvary for your sins, and you can know his, his precious promises. You can know that God has reserved in heaven something special for you through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's stand together with our heads bowed.